Welcome everyone to part two of our introductory video on the quantum model of the atom. If you haven't watched part one, please go back and start there because we are just continuing the same lesson here that we began in part one of the video. We left off describing the second quantum number. And now we're going to move into the third quantum number, which is called the magnetic quantum number, which is given the symbol M with a subscript L. So note that L was the symbol for the secondary quantum number. So we'll see that these two numbers are related. One way of thinking about the qu magnetic quantum number is it, that it describes the orbitals which are available at a given sublevel. So note that it is in reference to a specific sublevel. Another way of thinking about this, uh, quant uh, this quantum number is thinking about it as describing the different orientations that are possible for every sublevel type. The allowable values for M sub L are the integers ranging from negative L to positive L. So once again, the magnetic quantum number's values depend on what sublevel we are talking about. So for example, when L is equal to zero, remember that is an S type sublevel. There's only one possibility, M sub L is equal to zero. What that means, there's only one orbital available at the sublevel, or another way of thinking about it, there's one orientation at this sublevel. As I mentioned in the previous video, and when L is equal to zero or an S type sublevel, that is a spherical shape. So if we think about it in terms of orientation, it makes sense. A sphere can only have one orientation because it's symmetrical. So we see here the connection between L and uh, ML. If we move to L is equal to two, the possible values range from negative L to positive L. So as a result, we have five possible values, negative two, negative one, zero, one, positive one, and positive two. So that means when L is equal to two, which was a D type sublevel, there are five orbitals at this sublevel. And recall an orbital is the term that we started off with here is that an orbital is the region in space where we're likely to find an electron. So that means when L is equal to two, there are five distinct regions that can hold electrons. The final quantum number here is the spin quantum number, M subscript S. Each electron in an orbital exhibits what's called a magnetic moment or a spin state. And specifically, every electron within the same orbital is going to have an opposite magnetic moment. The experimental uh, evidence for this is by looking at the magnetic properties of elements that have paired electrons and unpaired electrons. And it turns out that elements that have unpaired valence electrons exhibit some unique magnetic uh, properties uh, due to the fact that their magnetic moments don't cancel out. So we'll talk about that further in class. There are two allowable values for this spin number and they are opposing numerical values, positive one half and negative one half. So in every orbital, one electron is assigned the positive one half MS value and then the other electron is assigned the negative one half value. So only two possible values. There's an important principle in, um, in physics and chemistry called the Pauli exclusion principle. And it states that no two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers. As a result, this limits the number of electrons that can share an orbital to two. So if you have two electrons that are at the same main energy level, or in the same sublevel, and are in the same orbital, they're gonna have the same first three quantum numbers. But because they're in the same orbital, 
and electrons in the same orbital have to have opposite magnetic spin states, one of those electrons is going to have a positive one half, one's going to have a negative one half, and now you've used up the possible values, so there's no more room for any electrons. So this spin quantum number limits the number of electrons per orbital to two. Now let's summarize this and put together an electronic structure of the atom. The electrons themselves are most likely to be found in these three-dimensional regions called orbitals. Each orbital has a capacity of two electrons. We define an orbital as regions of high probability of finding an electron, recognizing that an electron could be outside of that orbital, but if we're likely to find it, it's going to be in that region in space. All the orbitals that have the same energy make up what's called a sublevel. And we described four sublevel types for the known elements. An S-type sublevel, when L is equal to zero, has only one orbital available. And we saw that with the magnetic quantum number. A P-type sublevel, L is equal to one, has three orbitals available, and so on and so forth. Since each orbital can hold two electrons, this gives a capacity for every sublevel type. So every S-type sublevel has a capacity of two electrons, and those two electrons are found in one orbital. Whereas an F-type sublevel, and every F-type sublevel has a capacity of 14 electrons found in seven distinct regions in space or seven orbitals. And finally, we group those sublevels together in terms of energy levels, in terms of their average distance from the nucleus. And remember, this is really Bohr's model. So what we've seen here is that we've taken what Bohr started with these energy level ideas, these distinct distances from the nucleus, and we've refined it further to develop a more detailed picture of the electrons. So rather than just being at a distance from the nucleus, like the principal quantum number talks about, we talk about regions that are very close together and that have different shapes. And those regions can be divided up into even smaller specific regions called orbitals, which have the capacity for two electrons. So it's important to view Bohr's model as the first step on our journey into developing the quantum model of the atom. Energy levels themselves also have a capacity. You may have learned this previously, that the capacity is given by the formula 2n squared, where n is the principal quantum number. So first energy level can hold two electrons. Second energy level has a capacity of eight third energy level, capacity of 18, and so on and so forth. And this formula still holds true in the quantum model. Let's end off this video with another visual representation now that we've described the quantum model of the atom. Unlike with Bohr-Rutherford diagrams, we won't be doing too many drawings of orbitals because as you can see, they get very complex quickly and we're talking about three-dimensional spaces. It's just not easy to write that down on paper. So, but here we have are some visual representations of the different, different sublevel types and the orbitals that are at each sublevel. So let's look at this. Up here is a visual representation of an S-type sublevel. An S-type sublevel has only one orbital available, only one orientation, and that's a sphere. A p-type sublevel is shaped like two lobes, but there are three different orbitals or three different orientations that are available at a p sublevel, and each of those orientations holds two electrons. So we have two electrons in the first, two electrons in the second orientation, and two electrons in the third orientation for a total of six electrons that can be held at the p-type sublevel. 
I should note as well is that in all of these diagrams, we can imagine the nucleus being at the origin of these graphs. And as we move down, we see that the orientations or shapes of the different sublevels get quite complex, but just think of them as being regions in space. And that at a D sublevel, there are five distinct regions in space, so five orbitals, each which can hold two electrons, so for a total of 10, 10 electrons. Now, one thing we've done here is we've separated all these regions into their own graphs. In reality, these are all layered upon each other, um, all on the same graph with the nucleus in the, uh, in the middle. So you, as you can imagine, if I tried to put all of these orbitals all on the same axes, it would be come, become pretty much impossible to understand or visualize. So uh, that's why they're separated into their own little axes. So even though we don't need to memorize or draw these different orbitals, it's helpful to look at these pictures and to visualize a bit what we're talking about when we're talking about regions in space and electronic orbitals.